Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Gordon, welcome back. I've uh, been anxiously anticipating this conversation. Thank you, Kerry. It's good to be with you again. Again. Yeah. So um, I want to go back because we covered a lot of ground so far in your two previous uh, podcast episodes. But I want to go back to the defining moment of your life, one of the defining moments of your life, the day you describe as the day you hit the wall. I think there are so many leaders listening who have hit the wall, are hitting the wall, or about to hit the wall. What happened to you as a young leader the day you hit the wall? Well, I've always kind of observed in my life and in the life of people I know fairly well that every seven to 10 years, there's an event that happens for a lot of us. It's hard to imagine what the event could be, but it's one of those that really kind of kicks the stool out from under you. Um, a lot of times we instantly say, oh, you fell into some kind of sin. Yeah, maybe, but not always necessarily. The phrase that you're referring to, I used in the book, Ordering Your Private World, to describe probably one of the first massive experiences I had in my adulthood where things happened that no one had ever told me might come. Hmm. And I was, I was in my 29th year. I'd been a pastor for, oh, about four years in a fairly large church, at large in those days, you know, several hundred people. That puts you in the large category in those days. Hmm. I'm 29. Um, life is really getting cranked up. And there was a period of time when, oh, maybe six or eight weeks, I had several funerals, um, and the deaths of some of these people were just remarkable experiences. They had, they, they, they had no meaning to them, and there was a, a sense in which the death was tragic and meaningless, and I had to come up with some funeral sermons for that. So I had these funerals, and then I'd said yes to far too many speaking situations, uh, and really, was I was shooting off the top of my head. I wasn't really doing either the intellectual or the spiritual preparation that one should do. Thirdly, we had some conflicts going with some of the leaders. So you, you, you get this whole hodgepodge of unsettling events, which are, are coming at you from all over the place. Oh, and finally, one more. I was going seven days a week, probably 16 hours a day. Wow. It was, you know, it was just the life of a young woman or a young man who's exceedingly ambitious and you're just doing everything. Mm. So in the middle of that, it came a Saturday morning and I came down for breakfast. Well, not I came down the stairs from our second floor to our home. And I said to Gail, who was fixing breakfast, I said, um, I'm not staying for breakfast. And I said, I, I got to get to the office. I got to start studying. I don't even know what I'm going to preach about tomorrow morning. Yeah. You know, and I thought she'd admire me for this. And she turned around and she said to me, do you realize how long it's been since you've spent any time with the children? Hmm. And as she said that, the children were coming down the stairs. And I was gripped by this question, which I couldn't answer because she was, it was a question of truthfulness. And I was hearing those kids behind me and realizing I'd been ignoring them pretty badly. And you know what I started to do? I've told this story a thousand times. I just broke into tears and started crying. Hmm. And in order to get out of the line of sight of the children who were down at the main floor by now, I ducked out the kitchen. And I went to the living room. I threw myself on the couch and I started weeping uncontrollably. And that went on for four hours. Wow. I, I could not stop. I remember some of my thoughts um, during that time. Is this what they call nervous breakdown? Yeah. You know, is, is this God punish me in some way? You know, 
what the heck is going on here? I've never done this before. Gail was so wise. She she got our kids off in the next minutes to the neighbor's house. And she came to where I was and just held me in her arms and sat there with me that whole four hours. And it was about a noontime when I finally dried up. And so that then led to this question, what do I do about this? And Gail said to me, she said, why don't you just stay here? I'll bring you something to eat. And ask yourself the question for the the afternoon, what's God saying to you? Hmm. Now, that's not a question at the age of 29 I was used to asking. Right. Um, I was a person on the front side of this hitting of the wall. I had a, a lot of natural giftedness, like I suspect you do. Um, we're, we're, we're just people who know how to operate under almost any circumstances. We think big. We think automatically and systematically. Um, I had a, a lot of natural ability to speak compellingly. Words came easily to me. Uh, I could hold my own in any conversation. Uh, all that stuff, which what I would call external stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's the way I've been operating for the last four or five years. And you know what, Kerry? It was working. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was yeah. Working. At the time, people thought I was terrific. <laughs> And then comes this day, and here I am in the afternoon, and Gail is saying, see if you can hear what God is trying to say to you. Mm. And I realized that's not a question I ask myself very often. I'm not practiced in knowing what God says. I, I've just lived out the externals. And so I laid there for the whole afternoon, and around mid-afternoon, I'm, I'm recreating this because this happened 50, 50 plus years ago. Mm. Suddenly there comes a voice, and believe me, um, I'm not a person who claims that he hears the voice of God very often. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. So this is this is unique. I'm hearing a voice, and this is what the voice said, and I've been repeating this for 55 years now. The voice said, now you know what it's like to live out of an empty soul. I didn't know I had a soul. Hmm. I'd heard the word all of my life in church life, but tell me what a soul is. In those days, even in graduate school, seminary, we didn't talk much about the soul, at least to the extent that helped you to understand what it is and why it's there. Now you know what it's like to live out of an empty soul. And what I heard the voice in effect saying to me was, you want to live like this, you're not going to last very much longer. And with that, I got up from the couch, and um, I started thinking through, how am I going to figure this all out? And how am I going to fill this soul that some voice says is empty? And I, you're going to ask me in another moment, what was the logic of this? But the first thing I decided to do was to go down to the town and buy a notebook and bring it back and start writing a journal and try to see if I could systematically begin to decide, to, to define what life was like and what was going on in this soul thing that needed to be recorded so I could keep going back to it again and again and again. And that's the way that day went. And by the end of the night or the end of the evening, I was pretty committed to the notion that, that if there's an interior life, I was going to de- I was going to explore it. And I was going to play off that for the rest of my life, if possible. <laughs> so that's a long answer to a short question. Um, but I guess that, if I could add one thing to it, I, you know, it, that's not the only time I've hit the wall. Uh, I have a theory, and you'll hear a lot of my theories. I have a theory that most people hit the wall about every seven to ten years. <laughs> it could be exhaustion. It could be a conflict of a type. It could be a massive catastrophic failure and what you're doing as a leader. Or it could be what I went through that day where God finally says, I'm not going to let you keep on going much longer if you don't make some changes. What are what are some of the other walls you've hit since then? I went through a short period of time in those earlier years where I had a very 
baffling clinic, uh, conflict with a coworker. If you were to say to me now, what's that conflict about? I can't remember what it was about. All I know is that something got out of control in my soul. And, and it got out of control to the point where I kind of hated this guy. I mm. couldn't stand to even think about him. Mm. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and I, that was the first thing I thought about. I became more and more irritable at my wife and my children as I took out my irritability against this person to them. And this went on for several weeks, and it was really, really affecting my attitude, my mood, my sense that in any way God was operating in me or through me to other people. And I began to wonder, am I going to live like this? Mm. And um, there came a weekend when I was on an airplane, and again, kind of a voice, although not as dramatic. And this time the question is, where are you going? Well, I'm going to such and such a place. What are you going to do there? I'm going to preach for the weekend. What are you going to preach about? I'm going to preach on the love of Christ. <laughs> oh, the love of Christ. You know a lot about the love of Christ, don't you? Well, yeah, all except for this one person. And I can't, I can't erase him from my mind. I can't get over this. I can't get above this. Hmm. And then the word came, you could try forgiving. I thought I tried forgiving. Well, you never asked me for the power to forgive. Lord, I need the power to forgive this man. I need the power. I've got to preach this weekend, and I'm in no shape to do it. And in that moment, Carrie, I had this experience of something cutting a big hole in my chest. And out of the hole came some of the most awful liquid feelings that I can imagine. And this went on for a half hour. And it only stopped about the time that the plane's wheels touched the ground. And I got off that plane and I was 50 pounds lighter. Something had changed within me. And God wiped that grudge holding. He wiped that fierce feeling, hmm. that hatred out of me. And I fairly danced off that plane. And Carrie, I went off on that weekend to preach some of the most powerful sermons I have ever preached in my life. I was just a young man. But God seemed to give me a, a you know, the old people called it an unction. Hmm. And when I got up into the pulpit that weekend and opened my Bible, the words flowed, and the people were, were clearly listening very carefully. And at the end of the Sunday, um, I, I just was breathless with what I had experienced by the Holy Spirit empowering me. And the finish of the story is that late in the evening, the leaders of that church came to me where I was staying, and they said, you know that our church is looking for a senior pastor. And our, our searching sheet calls to look for a person who's about 45 years of age. But you have shown us today a spirit that this church badly needs. Hmm. And our people are calling all over the place and asking us if we would talk with you about being our pastor. About eight or ten weeks, I forget how long a period of time, Gail and I moved to that city. I became the pastor of that church, and I had seven or eight years of just wonderful ministry. Hmm. And I say to myself, and I, when I think about this story, I think to myself, what would life like be like today if that event on the plane had not happened? Where would I have gone? Would I have met you? Would we be having this conversation? Would I even be in some form of Christian ministry? You never know as you're crossing the pathways or the junctions of life hour after hour each day when God might direct you in some direction you never, ever considered. Hmm. And here are your whole life changes. That was a hitting of the wall moment that whole weekend for me in the bad side and the good side. Yeah, it's funny how those are hinge points, right? Because at the time, that was probably some of the deepest pain you had been in, particularly when you were 29, that, that would have been one of the deepest valleys you'd ever experienced. And yet it became 
the birth of something great. We're, we're going to talk a lot in this conversation about public life because almost everybody who listens to this podcast has some form of public leadership. It's a leadership podcast. So preachers, business leaders, entrepreneurs, et cetera, et cetera, versus the private life. And your book, which I read back when I was in law school, so that was a long time ago, it was already a bestseller uh, back in the 80s and 90s or whenever it came out. Do, do you remember the year it was published, Ordering Your Private World? Was it 80? The first edition came out around 1984. Yeah, no kidding. I was in high school. Isn't that terrifying? But uh, I was in high school, Gordon. And, uh, and I think I'd picked it up maybe a decade later when I was in uh, law school. And, uh, and it was great. We read it. We were in a small group. We read it. It's, it's just such a privilege to me that we've developed a friendship and I've actually gotten to know you. But I remember it being so impactful. So almost everybody here is like public life. What was your private life like in your 20s before you hit the wall? Oh, I would I would like to think that it was it was a wonderful private life. Hmm. A large part of the key was that my wife Gail was an unusual woman in partnering with me in pastoral ministry. Hmm. The people of the church loved Gail; they just absolutely yeah. loved her. And uh, I know sometimes it sounds like I'm being foolishly modest, but I I felt sometimes like I was almost flying on the tail of her graciousness and her hospitality. We want her, but we're going to take you as well, kind of thing. <laughs> That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. We had, we had gotten married. We both came out of broken families. Hmm. We spent some good time in our engagement, really thinking through the model of the marriage we wanted to pursue. So that when we, we got married, I think we were ready to face all the surprises. If you had known us in those first eight or 10 years, I think you would have said, this is a truly happily married couple. And I think mm-hmm. that would have been the truth. Um, we, you come into our home, Gail, you know, we didn't have much money. We didn't have an opulent home, but everybody felt welcome there. And it, mm-hmm. it was a place where the hand of God seemed often to be so, so ready uh, to touch, touch people. Um, there was a lot of laughter in our home. And I think both of us were working hard to try to grow in whatever ways we felt God wanted to. So things were going, for, for people in their 20s, I think things were going pretty well. But that doesn't mean you can't hit some walls. And Yeah. So your private life, like if people walked into your home, they would say, oh, this is pretty happy. But you, you make the point that your interior life, maybe that's the, the, the term I'm looking for. What was going on inside you wasn't enough to sustain the public pressure and platform? One of the things, you got my mind running here now, but I think what, what the, the good news and the bad news in my younger leadership years were that God had given me a, a real interesting package of natural gifts. Hmm. And there's a lot of men and women in leadership who spend a lot of years coasting along on natural gifts. Yes. The ability to speak compellingly, to think quickly on your feet. I mentioned these a few moments ago. The charm that makes everybody happy around you. you. You can be with old people, young people, and the results are both good. You can talk well off the top of your head. You know, I, I'm, I know you're like, you must have been like this. You, can, you could do a sermon if you had 15 minutes notice. Um, perhaps. Yeah. No, there's a lot of similarities there, Gordon. Natural gifting gets you far, but it only gets you so far. Well, that's the point. And yeah. I think of this, a, a lot of men and women who get into leadership and they move along for 10 years on their natural gift. But then they hit one of these walls, yep. often, you know, around 37 or 38 years of age. They hit, they hit a wall. And that's when you start seeing people leave leadership, mm. you know, broken hearted, feeling like they're exhausted. They're bored. They've run out of ideas. And I meet a lot of young pastors who will come up around 37, 38 and they'll say, you know, I just don't know how much longer I can keep doing this. My wife doesn't like the ministry anymore. I don't mm-hmm. know my kids. I'm running out of ideas uh, for myself. And so it's about that point where the external life kind of lets you down. And that's what would have happened to me if it had not been that particular Saturday morning. 
The seven to 10 year framework is really interesting. I've thought about that a lot. We talked about it before, but you're right. So I was in university from 19 to 31, which is crazy, but three degrees, long circuitous route into ministry, history, law, theology, blah, blah, blah. But it was around the decade mark that I hit my wall, the burnout. And I think you're right. A lot of that was natural gifting, natural charisma, and then, you know, for me, it, it was almost as abrupt as what it sounds like it was for you, Gordon. Um, Thomas Holmes, and you, you write about this in Ordering Your Private World, talks about life change units or traumatic events. Can you explain that? You know, um, uh, you know how, how, how do life change units, what are they? And then how do they impact stress, fatigue, and leadership? Thomas Holmes created something called the stress scale. Yeah. We're not talking about something that's new. This is back about 30 years ago. Yeah. It's held its weight and its credibility. And um, I think there are people who still would um, applaud the stress scale of Thomas Holland. What he did was he researched several thousand people who underwent um, physical or maybe even emotional breakdown. And then he re- reverse engineered and we, he went back in their lives and he made a record of the kind of stress points in their lives over the five years before the breakdown. If I remember right, he locates about 150 samples of w- what you and I are calling wall hitting moments. Mm. Um, and not all of them are negative or bad. But what he did is he he looked at these, and then he looked at the people who went through them up to the breakdown, and he began to give point totals that would help you to compare the stress of particular issues, like to lose a loved one in death mm. that is worth 100 points. Yeah. Christmas is 12 points because okay. it's in Christmas, he said. It's stressful. It's wonderful, and it's stressful. Yeah. So you, what he did was it very cleverly, he, he listed all of these different stresses, the negative and the positive. He gave them point totals that seemed to apply to the seriousness of the situation. And his conclusion was, you can live with 150 points in a year's time, and there'll be no detrimental effect. You can go from 100 points to, to uh, 300 points. And now to the, the growth of those numbers, uh, you will begin to face physical breakdowns and maybe even emotional breakdowns. Hmm. If you go over 300 in one year, it's a miracle if you'll survive it. Yeah, and I think that's kind of worked itself into the vernacular. I'm sure most leaders, and I, I didn't know Thomas Holmes until I reread the book, but it's like, you know, sometimes I'll sit down with people, I'm, they're upset or whatever. And I'm like, what have you been through? Well, I did have a significant death in my family. We moved. I changed jobs. Uh, sometimes people would say we're in financial trouble or my marriage isn't good or, you know, whatever it happens to be. And again, if you assign those all point totals, as he talks about, their stress is through the roof. And so you had had all those funerals, which is certainly a big deal. You had a lot of stressors that kind of just pushed you out of what your natural gifting could sustain. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Now, now sometime open your Bible and see what you would do with the major biblical characters on a stress scale. You know, look at Paul and, uh, you know, in second Corinthians 12, when he lists all those things he's going through, you know, I was shipwrecked three times. I was beaten. I was starved. I was, uh, I, I, he, the list is endless. And you said to yourself, this guy had to be at 550 points if he was at home. <laughs> and, you know, and, and the worst of all the points, Holmes doesn't mention, but when he gets to the end, he says, and beside all these stress points, I've had the anxiety of the churches. Right, right. Yeah, Holmes didn't mention that, did he? No. It's a wonderful line, you know, and Paul says, he who suffers, I suffer with him. How mm. many people was Paul suffering, suffering with? Uh, so he must have had a remarkable up, uptick on the stress. Uh, scale. It's so clarifying. Now, where I really want to drill down on today with you, because I listened to the audio book and then I, I reread um, the book book. By the way, it would have been great to have you narrate that audio book. So maybe, you know, for a summer project, you could, you could narrate it for uh, the publisher. I just love your voice. Anyway, that's an aside. That's an aside, Gordon. 
Um, you write about the difference between being driven and being called. And it was just so haunting for me. I felt like, felt like I saw my leadership life kind of flash before my eyes. Um, let's start here. How can you spot a driven person? Because my guess is most of the people who listen to a show like this, their friends would say they're pretty driven. You don't listen to leadership podcasts in your spare time unless you have some degree of drive in you. How would you, how would you define, how do you spot a driven person? Well, I, I, I probably sound like I know more than I really do. But just to fool with an idea, I put drivenness over here at one end of the arc, and I put calledness on the other end of the arc. Okay. Maybe as time goes by, we're moving back and forth in these things. One of the words which comes to me about drivenness um, that helps me to understand it is addiction. Hmm. And uh, I, I think the driven person is often addicted uh, to certain kinds of needs. Um, that may grow up even from childhood. I, I feel like by nature, I'm a driven person, or was anyway, when I was more organizationally active than I am. Same, today. same. But uh, I've, I often, when I was doing the book, I was asking myself the question, so Gordon, you're a driven person, assuming where to come from. Hmm. And the first place I would tell you it came from, it came from the fundamentalist theological background that I grew up in as a child. We were always trying to please people, mm. to please the Sunday school teacher, uh, to please my father, to please my mother. Um, you could never do enough. And uh, so you grow up in those early years, and that's where drivenness can really kick in as a child. Um, I remember watching my father, very class. he was a pastor in those days, and we, he and I did not make it well at all, but I admired him. Nevertheless, and I was very much aware that people loved to hear him preach, and they sat on under his preaching with their open Bibles, taking their notes and their colored pencils. And I could I could remember the age of five or six years of age saying, "I'd like to do that. I'd like to be that person up there, like my father." And I think the drivenness kicked in at that point. Hmm. Then, as the years go by, you you find people praise you for doing certain things. Oh, Gordon's 13 years of age, and he's already going to be a preacher of the gospel. Isn't this wonderful? And you love to hear these things about you, and you need to hear them more and more and more, like the addict needs more, whatever the trigger is, is that uh, gets them going mm -hmm. some, some direction. I, I, I could be very, very unfair in, in my observation, but I think the the majority of men and women who go into Christian leadership probably are taking a spirit of drivenness into it, which has to be flogged and excised as the early years of adulthood go. If they don't, they probably will not last a full lifetime. Yeah, you know, Gordon, I, I agree with you. And I think you could apply that to most of leadership. I mean, if you think about it by definition, whether you're leading a, a a church of a hundred or a church of 10,000 or a company of 10 or a company of, you know, 10,000 employees, by definition, when you get to the C-suite, when you get to the top, there's very few of you. And I've always been a leader. You know, that was, I was the guy in high school where if something wasn't organized, I'd step in and organize it. If I go into a room, it's in chaos, I'll try to bring order. And I think there's definitely a bit, a lot of drivenness inside me so I think you're reading the mail of almost everybody who's listening to this podcast like they are. There is a drivenness in that. And even if you're a person of faith, if you're a Christian, you know, in our case, you and me, um, there's still a drivenness there that needs some kind of redemption. Um, what are the downsides of being driven? Like, what is the shadow side of being a driven leader? Driven people, I, I, this is not in priority order. Um, driven people can be angry people. Mm. Um, they want things to go their way. And when they don't, when someone puts a monkey wrench into the works, you can see anger. We've seen some big illustrations of leaders in the last several years who couldn't control their anger. Hmm. And, uh, and it, it finally lost them their leadership in one way or the other. People finally said, I'm not going to work with this guy anymore. Yeah. Um, I wrote down some other thoughts. People become obsessed about the symbols of leadership. 
Um, they have to have the best office. They have to drive the nicest car. They have to be in charge. They have to sit at the head of the table. They are always reminding you that they're one step above you. Um, there are people who are always addicted to expansion. No sooner have they finished one building program that they're beginning another. I, I recall a few years ago uh, being invited to speak at one of our large mega churches in this country that had just finished a huge sanctuary building program. And before I went into the building for the first time, I, I walked around its circumference, which <laughs> seemed like almost a mile of walking. <laughs> but I looked at this whole thing now just a few months in existence, and I thought, what has this man done to himself? Mm. What's he done to his people? Who's going to pick this all up when he lays it down? What generation following this generation is going to pick up the payments for this place? and maintain it. They're happy if you want to build it, but they don't want to build it most of the time. Yeah. It wasn't long after that, that this guy was booted from his position. And uh, so there's a big monument out there. Wow. Uh, I saw, I, I think about that kind of thing. I think driven people sometimes short sheet their integrity. They cut corners. Hmm to get people to do what they want to do. You, you pick it up, for example, in the truthfulness of their preaching. And you see it in the way they manipulate people. A little bit of exaggeration, a little bit of spin here and there. It, it works sometimes. <laughs> it does work. I wrote down here that a lot of driven people have poor people skills. Hmm. Uh, they're not really good. They, they're not really good at the one-on-ones. Uh, I think back sometime in one of our previous conversations, I told you about my friend Marilyn. Um, she was a woman who had some mental issues, mm -hmm. constantly medicated. And uh, I blew her off one day because I was talking to some important people and I blew her off. To this day, I'm haunted by the fact that Marilyn came over and she put herself right between me and the other person. And she said with her medicated voice, Pastor Mac, you say, hello, Marilyn, how are you? But you don't have time to find out. You're too busy with important people like me, others. I live with that rebuke to this day. Hmm. She was right. I've remembered that story. I, I find it haunting as well. Yeah. I think I've got some Marilyns in my life. Places where you see the drivenness. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, I think I think what they do is they, they burn their whole system out after a while hmm. and people become disillusioned working for them. I have this, any other signs of a driven person or the damage they do? Because um, I think this is good. I've, I've got time and this is like free therapy, everybody. So, you know, I'm taking notes. Gordon, anything else? I mean, your book is just so so good on this stuff. And again, so so haunting for me. I probably have given you a, a, as good a good list. list. Yeah. On this yeah. List. I have this image as I've been listening to your book, rereading it, preparing for this day. And I haven't tested this out on you. So if you don't think it, it works, you can just tell me. But when I think of a driven person, I think of sort of a picture of myself or whatever. And, and they're running. They're running from something. They're not really running towards something. They're running away from something. Do, yeah. Do you think driven people run away from things? Like what are they running from or what are they running to? It's like, what is that unchase? What is that chase about? Like, it's got to be bigger. It's got to be better. It's got to be, people are a means to an end. Um, I don't, you know, the, the ends justify the means. Like what, 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 when you look back at your life, what, were you running away from anything? Yeah, to some extent, I feel like in my early years, I was running away from getting too intimate with people. Oh, yeah. You know, I, my darling wife was the person who used to call me on this all the time. Mm. She would say, you know, you tell people you dearly love them, but you disappear the, meeting, the, minute, the minute the meeting is over. You don't... And I would say to her, I hate red wedding receptions. I can't stand going to Sunday school picnics. 
Now, what do those two have in common? If you go to a Sunday school picnic or a wedding reception, you're at the mercy of anybody who wants to approach you. Oh, yeah, you're right. And that was me. I wanted out. Interestingly enough, and this is Meyer, Myers-Briggs language, Gail is an extrovert mm. who feels if, if, she, if Gail has a drivenness in her, it's the drivenness to want to connect with everybody in the room. And Carrie, I can't, I can't begin to estimate to you how many times at the end of a morning worship service, after I had prayed for all the people and called them to Jesus and done all this nice stuff, the minute the amen was sounded, I was out the side door of the auditorium, off to a distant parking lot to sit in my car until Gail came out from meeting all the people. <laughs> and, and Gail would have, she would say to me sometimes, I don't understand you. People pay you to, 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 to draw off your spiritual energy, but you run from them. Tell me how that works. What's the logic behind that? So in some ways, she felt a drivenness to make up for what I was leaving behind. Hmm. And then when we learned Myers-Briggs for the first time, I began to understand who I was, um, why, why I ran from events like that, where I was at the mercy of anybody who wanted to talk to me. Mm. Uh, because I was an introvert in the best sense of the word, but I was running from people. I didn't want to get into all of those intimate conversations. What's really, I've noticed this in the last 10 or 15 years in, in my older years, the younger men and women who have built new churches, they're the people of the green room. Mm -hmm. And I, more than once I've come into a city to speak on a Sunday and uh, the, my, my minder will say to me, now, we'd like to pick you up at 20 minutes of the hour. It'll take 10 minutes to get to the church building. We'll take you into the green room. We've got your favorite snacks, your favorite uh, kinds of carbonated beverages. We've got candy. We've got fruit. And then when the congregation sings its third song, we'll take you out on the stage to speak. Yeah, very common. And I say to them, and I'll say to them, and I've done this every time, wait a minute, you don't understand. I'm a pastor. I want to get to the church 30 to 40 minutes before the service starts. And I don't want to go to the green room. I want to go to the auditorium. And I want to walk up and down the aisles and meet people. I want some people to say, when I begin to preach, I met him. And when the morning service is over, I don't want to go back to the green room. I want to stay up front or in the back, wherever you choose. I want to meet people. Now, that's the older Gordon. Mm. The younger Gordon would have loved the green room. <laughs> <laughs> what flipped for you? What changed with that? I, that's an interesting question. Um, I think just as I got older, I appreciated more and more the role of the pastor. Mm. Eugene Peterson's new biography. Um, one of the things that startled me, I should have known better. Peterson keeps saying over and over again, down through the years of his public life, I'm a pastor. I may write books, I may do this, I may teach in the classroom, but I'm a pastor. And anything I've done, I do. I do as a pastor. Well, as my life has gone on, I, I realized, yeah, I've written the books, I've taught in the classroom, I've run the organization, but I've always done it as a pastor. Mm -hmm. And in my second half of life, more and more the instincts of the pastor gripped me. And I found a wonderful calling in touching the cheek of an older widow woman who's 85 years of age or Gooding down on the floor on my knees, eyeball to eyeball with the small child. Um, when, I, when I was in my 50s and 60s, that really began to stir my soul to do those kinds of things. So I would, I would probably tell you it was the second half of my life that awakened me to what a pastor really does. And a pastor doesn't like a green room. Hmm. How did you reprogram your wiring? Or is that like a discipline? Did you? Did you just decide one day, like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this whether I want to or not? Or did your heart end up following? Well, yeah, that and a lot of stuff. I, I, I don't want to keep bringing Gail into this. Um, 
No problem there at all. But the fact of the matter is, Gail was the pastor, and all I had to do was watch her and see how things should be done. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think in, in our second half of marriage, we're celebrating our 60th, 60th anniversary pretty soon. Congrats. She had a lot to teach me um, yeah. in terms of what, what pastoring really looks like. Then there was the biographical reading, reading people like in the life of a Eugene Peterson and people mm-hmm. of older generations in the 1700s and 1800s and seeing what a pastor did in those days. But I, I became more and more restive in the second half of my life that um, how did people see Jesus in me? And how could I bring them closer to a Jesus experience? And that's what a pastor does. So I became much more comfortable uh, with it as time went by. Thinking about drivenness, does insecurity sometimes play a role in oh, sure. being driven? Yeah. Can we, can we talk about that? Yeah, I, I, can I help you on that one? I, I, when I think about, it, you know, every time you present a word like that, I'm saying to myself, yeah, I, I, I've been there, I've been done. Oh yeah, no, insecurity has been part of my journey too. Yeah, I think my my insecurity came from never feeling like I measured up to my father, mm. and uh, and I want, gee, I wanted to please him so badly, and uh, and the interesting thing about our relationship was that there came a day when if you measure a person in terms of their effectiveness and efficiency, I passed him by. I could mm, no where, where the son kind of exceeded the father in terms of, quote, success, yeah. accomplishment. Yeah. And that's not unusual in this day and age for a leader to, to have that experience. But, yeah. but I did have insecurity about, you know, how do you please your father? I, I probably had an overactive imagination, and I looked at all these other guys in my peer group And I could think of every reason why they were better than me and everything that we did one by one. And so uh, in that first half of life, I I just, I did lack a lot of self-confidence. But around my mid forties, I began to say, you know, this, this doesn't mean anything. And I can talk about that in a moment, but um, my second half of life became really freeing. And then when I had a catastrophic moment in life 35 years ago, um, that takes you down a long way mm-hmm. and you're at the mercy of God and you're at the mercy of the people around you who put people in positions and don't. And, um, you know, I just learned what it was like to live and the dependency of the mercy of other people. I'll keep recommending rebuilding your broken world. Is that, I always get the title slightly wrong. Is that, is that the book, Gordon? Rebuilding your broken world. Oh, such a good book. Uh, to this day, it continues to go because a lot of broken worlds keep getting broken. Yeah. Yeah. And your life is kind of a hinge point, isn't it? From your early 40s to today. You just turned 82. Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> we talked last, just before your birthday, a couple of weeks ago before this interview. Um, yeah. And okay. So that is drivenness. And then anything else on drivenness? Well, I, let me see. Did I write anything down that I want to talk to you about? I just just the driven people produce shallow people. Ooh. And uh, you know, a congregation in the long run rises no higher than the persons who are in charge of their spiritual journey up front. If you if you stay, and I'm sure you've experienced this, Carrie, if you stay at a church for twelve years. People will start praying like you pray. Mm-hmm. They will learn how to pray in the way the pastor prays. So if your prayers are the prayers of a driven person, if your prayers are superficial, if your prayers are only time takers to get the band up on the stage, yes. people are going to start praying like that. Mm-hmm. If you're a driven person, with you're, you're probably going to preach the Bible and all of its meanings in rather shallow ways. I, I'm not talking about honest simplicity, but I'm talking about amusing people. Yeah, a superficiality. And so it. a driven person is going to leave a lot of shallow people behind him when he goes out the door. Hmm. And, and finally, I would say a driven person probably leaves a congregation when he goes out the door um, that really doesn't know who it is and where it's going. 
uh, because he has not given them a deep sense of focus and perseverance um, that that goes past his tenure. A called person, which would be the opposite of driven, would be a person who always leads the, leads the congregation better than when they found it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons I so value our friendship. There are definite um, parallel points in our journey, and I think I think it's almost like to some extent a universal journey. Most people who get into leadership that that splinter of people who end up, you know, in the C suite on top of an organization, starting things, founding things, that kind of thing. We're a weird bunch, and I think drivenness gets us there, Gordon. Right, and then. The, you're right. Some people never get out of that. That's just their whole life. It's driven, driven, driven. Eventually you retire, whatever you do. But there's an alternative, and that's calledness, calledness. And um, I, I would love to know, what does a called person look like? Well, let me get into that by just one step backwards for a second and saying, Paul was probably a driven person. Mm-hmm. He had to get baptized out of that. And I think to his very last day, there was drivenness in him that he had to constantly capture. Why he has to write 2 Corinthians to apologize for 1 Corinthians kind of thing, right? (laughs) Wonderful example. I would never have thought of that one, but that's a beautiful example of of Paul. Now now when you get into the called person, and if you've refreshed yourself on ordering your private world, you know that I spent several pages with John the Baptizer. Uh, John was a guy who, if, if there was a life changer in my earlier years, John may have been it. I, I just really felt, felt it to a point where I, I loved that guy. Uh, he was as weird as anything. Yeah. But, but there were qualities he brought to the table that I badly could relate to. And one of my favorite paragraphs comes in John chapter 3, when... We watch Jesus, who's now come to where John is. Jesus is baptized. He starts going away, and people start following him. And uh, if you if if you allow my imagination to work, here's John standing there, and I imagine him looking as people are going over the hill, and he's watching his crowd disappear. For nine months, he's been the talk of the town. For nine months, everybody in Judea and the surrounding area has been going out to hear him preach. Pharisees, Sadducees, and soldiers and everything, they're all out there. And then one day they start to dissipate, which Mm -hmm. is one of the most terrible fears of any leader. My crowd's going to leave me. And and some people come, and I've never really been sure whether they were friends or critics or both. And in effect, they say to him, you know, what are you going to do? The crowd has left you. They're going after him. What's going to happen to you? And in that moment, John gives us a four-point outline, which I probably have preached more than any other text in the scripture. Okay. You know, the first thing he seems to be saying to us is, you know, yeah, I preached for nine months to that crowd, but they were never mine. They were God's. He loaned them to me to give them something. And if he wants to take away, it's his right to do it. So there they go. Hmm. And I've looked at that and I thought, boy, has a pastor do I own my congregation or do I manage it? Hmm. Because it's very easy to, you know, start talking about my church, my right. people. And it's a good discipline to say, no, this is his church. I'm just here managing it until he finds a better manager. This ministry belongs to him. And that's something we need to teach every young woman and every young man who's going into leadership. This is not your work. It's God's work through you. And the second thing John says is, you've heard me say many times I am not the Christ, but I'm the one sent before him. So John's just kind of one step or two steps below the messianic uh, label. Hmm. And uh, um, I've often thought, I wonder how many times John, on one of those spectacularly successful days, how How many times did John lay in his tent and say to himself, you know, they really liked me today. (laughs) (laughs) If if I was in charge, I could really do this. I could really do that. What leader doesn't have those fantasies? 
And I wonder if he says, John says to himself, well, somebody called me Elijah today. Somebody called me the great prophet that Moses predicted. I guess I really am pretty good, right? Like they're coming from miles. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I haven't thought about that. Then finally, John says, well, maybe I am the Christ. You know, wow. maybe I am him. I mean, they love me so much. So that when the crowds start to walk away, what protects John from that kind of dangerous thinking? It's the fact that he knew who he was and who he wasn't. Hmm. And I think that's something all the way through life, Carrie, um, that you and I have to work on. We have to remember every day who we are and who we're not. Third thing, uh, I have been called to be the one who introduces the groom. Um, that's my job. You've done weddings. You know the best man is there to introduce the groom and the bride, not to take the attention to himself. Mm -hmm. John is saying, I'm only the best man at the wedding. And then finally, that amazing phrase, he must increase and I must decrease. That's what a a rabbi would say. Mm. Uh, Or a disciple would say about a rabbi. That paragraph has marked our ministry. Uh, We... In this house, we turn to that over and over and over again and consider that the, the straight edge of what call to ministry is about. That's the way call people see uh, see things and speak. Yeah, and you, we're going to come back to call of this in a, in a moment, but I, I do want to go there because you hinted at it. And you and I have talked about this just, you know, when we, when we catch up. Obscurity. So you're 82. And that's where every driven leader ends up, right? In obscurity. It's, it's that idea, can you name your great-grandfather? 90% of people can't do it. And we're in this space where it's like, why did I live this life? How, how do you prepare for obscurity, Gordon? Uh, well, you read, first of all, you read a lot of biography. Mm. Uh, you know me well enough now that I, I can't go very far without talking about biography. Yeah. I, I want to know the attitudes, the experiences, and the failures of the great women and men that God has called into service over the centuries. So uh, you begin to pick up the theme of obscurity uh, in a lot of biographers and how people live with it or didn't live with it. Secondly, I've, I've known a lot of pastors who had to step down from doing anything organizationally at the age of 68 or 69, somewhere around that. And what's appalled me is how many of them have left their ministries bitter. Hmm. They, they couldn't imagine that their people could let them go. And, uh, and now they, they haven't thought about this. And so here they are at 70 years of age. And many of them are living on poor financial foundations. Hmm. Um, and, and one of the things they discover is that very quickly after you leave a church, the people leave you because they start giving their love to the next person who's come along. So it never was your work in the first place. Right. Those are things that I hear from people and observe. And just plain pure logic said to me, um, I don't want the last 20 yards of my life to use a football term, the red zone of my life, to be lived hanging on the esteem of people. Uh, I had my opportunity with them. They know me. Now it's time for them to get on to somebody else. So Gail and I started planning for obscurity when we were in our early 60s. Hmm. Um, I I determined that when I turned 60 years of age, this is Gordon, not anybody else, that when I turned 60, I would step away from organizational leadership. Yeah. And that was a good decision. Um, you know, we we marshaled all of our finances in that direction so that when the time came, theoretically, we'd be able to pay for it. And, uh, and I would be able for the next many years of my life to do the things which I really felt were at the core of God's call in my life hmm. and basically building, you know, young, a younger generation. So, uh, you know, with that comes this notion you know, I'm going to start doing things in life that not many people are going to clap about. Um, they're, they're, they're not going to be calling me on the phone every morning. So I might as well start getting used to it now. And I had a wife who helped me to get used to that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, being Feeling that I'm moving into obscurity rather quickly really hasn't bothered me much at all. 
uh, I, I just keep looking back and saying, you know, I had 40 wonderful years of that, 10 years of this. It's been great. It doesn't last forever. And now I love get to live in a quieter side of life. Mm. And you know what, by the way? I, I'm learning how to meet my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm meeting neighbors I haven't met for a long, long time. And we like each other. <laughs> Gordon, there's such a joy and such a lightness in these conversations, and uh, I'm just I'm just so delighted. I've, I've shared this with you, and I'll, I'll share it with listeners. But um, you know, we're 400 and some odd episodes into this podcast, and 17 million downloads or whatever. But you are the only leader, and and again, anyone under 40 maybe is new to you. But these episodes, like the two that we've done prior to that, have uh, you're the only leader I've 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 interviewed who has two in the top five of all the episodes I've ever done. So I think you're leaving a huge deposit in the next generation, and I'm just so so grateful for that. And I've been thinking because you and I have talked offline and online about obscurity and. You know, I'm ready for that day. I always joke with my current team who does this podcast and writing and books and all that. Like, hey, there's going to be a day where there aren't 17 million downloads. There's going to be a day where nobody calls. There's going to be a day where nobody invites you to speak. There's going to be a day and you got to get ready for that day now and know that you've been a steward of that season while it lasted and it doesn't last forever. And, and you're right. You told me when I was stepping permanently off staff at Connexus, it's like, don't worry, they forget you quickly. And you're right, they forget you quickly. And that's okay. That's okay. There's a, there's a joy in that. So that does tear at calling. What are, what are some qualities and characteristics of a called person as opposed to a driven person? Well, a called person, uh, again, this is not in priority order puts a huge premium on personal growth. Hmm. They, I don't think it's wrong to say, in effect, as best as in me as possible, every day I will, I will learn something new that can be useful in God's work. So uh, I, I feel the importance of growing. Secondly, a called person is very, very passionate about developing the people around them. Hmm. They're always asking themselves the question, what do, what has God been speaking to me about and showing me that if I if I shared it with you, you might enjoy even more than I do, hmm. uh, or you know wh- wh- what is it that I can give in whatever way that's possible? Um, we had a family here for lunch just a few hours ago, and they brought four children with them that uh, are just beautiful, and uh, I, I just I find children like that you you want to make them feel welcomed into your home. Even a child is an important person. And, you know, Jesus made that clear. Don't stop the children from coming. So we had children here. And the question was how and in whatever way could we make them feel valued? I think called people think, try to think like that. Called people are very, very humble in the sense that they're, they're very willing to speak to their own brokenness. Mm. If I can tell you something about me that will help you to work through these issues, um, you know, that's, that's important to be able to do. Um, I, I did write some other things down here. Yeah, yeah, by all means. I, I would just finally say, I wrote down the word Christian character. I long to meet men and women who really show the fruits of Christ's presence in their life. Um, who, when you leave them, you're saying to yourself, I, I just want to love and revere Jesus more than I've ever done before because of their influence. I think those are the ways called people think. And then they emulate, of course, the things you and I said about John the Baptist. Hmm. Here, here's another theory, because I think I, I perhaps, I mean, there's still drivenness that haunts me on a daily basis, but I'm hoping I'm moving to more of a called existence than a driven one. I remember that moment in my life and, you know, I hit a wall too at 40 with my burnout. And I remember working through that with friends, counselors in prayer, you know, Tony, my wife and family members. And I remember being deathly afraid that the things that made me successful, my drivenness, would all be taken away and I would have almost instant obscurity. You know, there was that sense like success is a trap. Once you've been successful, it's really hard not to want more of that. But but one of the things I'm, I'm, and this is a theory, so feel free to disagree. 
Gordon, is that actually drivenness is not all bad. It needs to be redeemed. In other words, that ambition. Ambition can be selfish or it can be a stewardship. Um, The drive to reach more people can be selfishly motivated or it can actually be a stewardship of, my goodness, I hope, you know, 100,000 people hear this interview, not 1,000, right? That, That kind of thing. Is there a redemptive access? Like, like, did you become an entirely different person, or were just some of the some of the things that made you a driven leader? Did they get refined to the point where they they became more of a calling thing? Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm a little bit. Um, I have to be careful with myself because I don't want to, I don't want to puff myself. People who know who know me well have often said to me. We've known two Gordons in your lifetime. Hmm. Um, we've known the Gordon who made it up to the age of 42 or 43. And that Gordon was nice to have around. We loved him. But he could come across as very arrogant and know it all. And maybe even a little bit feelings of superiority over other people. We, we knew that Gordon and we were willing to live with him. But something changed around 42 or 43, and now there's a new Gordon. His voice is quieter. He thinks a lot more. Um, He listens. He doesn't always have to have the last word. That's the second Gordon. And if someone is willing to say those things because they've known me a little bit at this part of life, I I just want to raise hands and say, thank you, God. Mm. In, in my hitting of the wall on a number of occasions, now I can see Jesus was just bashing down all that old stuff that I thought was so great when I was a young man. And he's quieted me. I don't always have to be in charge anymore. I don't have to be the biggest and best. I'm not going to be anyway <laughs> if I wanted hmm. to. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, that out, that's a brief outline. Um, the thought that people would say you're quieter and we detect a humble spirit, that, that profoundly moves me. Hmm. Because how many years back on this other Gordon did I never hear that? And for the, me to hear this now says, well, you know, Jesus finally did get into your interior life and make something of a difference. And that's what you, that's what you want to hear from people. Hmm. Uh, you you want to hear that, that second half of life and I, 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 hardly a week goes by that I don't tell somebody, you know, you've probably got 25 to 30 more good years in you if you're 50 years of age. Yeah. People are living longer. And these are not going to be just sitting on a park bench watching kids play softball. These are going to be the most powerful years of your life because you're going you're gonna to take your experience, your wisdom, your authenticity as it's growing. It's all going to come together and it's going to produce wisdom and maturity. And so you, your life in your 60s and 70s are likely to be the very, very best years of your life. Plan on it. Mm. Oh, that is that is such a good word. You know, and as someone who's who's in the middle of my 50s, that that comes, I agree. There's a lot of life left. It's it's crazy. When your kids grow up and they leave home and you're like, oh, there's there's still life left. Weird question, maybe a bad one, but I want to ask it. How do you see the old Gordon, the pre-age 42? Have you made peace with him? Is it important to make peace with him? Do you, you know, you have regrets. I have regrets, I'm sure. But yeah, how do you relate to your former self? Uh, I I don't feel that that's a problem for me. I There are things... I was telling somebody yesterday about something I'd done when I was around 28 or 29. And mm. as I told the story, I was really embarrassed. I felt this flush of embarrassment. I, you know, and, and as I told the story, I thought to myself, I didn't really do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Or, you know, that was really stupid or that was immature. Or another way you say it is, Bless be the people who were willing to listen to all that stuff and not kick you out the front door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I, I look at my first half of life, and and I re- I have a very vivid imagination and memory. I I can recall my life almost month by month up through the years. I enjoy my own personal history. 
but it's nothing in comparison with the second half. And it, it's put on the shelf as a, like a museum piece. That's my history. Mm. Uh, you know, if I need some mercy, God give it to me. Uh, <laughs> Those were wonderful years of learning. Uh, Gail and I were reading about a trip I made back in 1973 or 74 to the jungles of the Amazon. And I'd forgotten so much of that experience, but it was a treat to look back and, um, you know, reimagine times when God gave me privileges that uh, a lot of other people didn't get in those days. Um, so there are a number of leaders listening right now who are like, oh, wow, I'm in the first half of that life. I'm driven. I'm convicted. I don't even know whether I like what I see right now. I see a bit of an alternative. What advice would you give them? Well, the first thing I'd be saying to any person under the age of 50 today is, boy, how fortunate you are if you're a servant of the Lord to be alive today. Um, I, I can't help but believe in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see a change in the Christian movement um, that we could never imagine in a lifetime. And those guys, those men and women who are going to be at the steering wheel during the next 15 or 20 years, they get to play a role in this. I, I think it's going to be a, um, some of the most massive changes that we've seen in 300 years. And you asked me where I get 300 from. I, it's just a nice round number. <laughs> but, you know, would you, have, would you have enjoyed living in Luther's day? Would you have enjoyed living in John Wesley's day? Uh, would it have been really fun to watch the modern missionary movement come alive and be a part of that? Because something of that magnitude is about to break on us. Hmm. And it may, may, it may mean going through a period of time where the church shrinks a little bit, and we have some real conflict, but uh, out of it is going to come something beautiful. And, uh, you know, I wish I was young enough so that I could, I could watch all that happen and perhaps even help encourage it. I don't expect to see it happen, but I'm positive it's going to. What makes you say that? Well, when you're 82, I open the obituary column in the New York Times every morning. And you know what? Almost everybody dies before 83. <laughs> <laughs> but what makes you say the bit, the bit about the church like it's nice to get a message of hope what what makes you think we're poised for a breakthrough poised for a what a breakthrough a breakthrough oh well i just i i think first of all we're going to have to reform how we present the gospel to the new generations hmm. they are not going to buy god bless billy graham i he was he was a moderate friend i love him uh but that kind of thing is not going to work anymore. Hmm. It has to be a new kind of evangelism. It's not just the, the method of evangelism, but it's the content of how we present the saving work of Christ to one another. And what's, this new generation is, is dealing with a whole new set of issues I never even heard of when I got into the ministry. Hmm. So I, I think it's likely that the church is going to shrink a bit because of the pandemic, uh, you know, already people are beginning to imagine that maybe one third of the people will not come back. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is there a good news, bad news to that? Maybe, maybe the pastor gets freed for a period of time of having to cater to a group of people who were never going to do anything anyway. Right. And, uh, and, and you've heard me say this, that probably the new pastor is going to be a trainer more important than a, being a preacher. Uh, I just feel that in my gut, that we're going to have to look at the pastoral ministry and um, compare it to a rabbinical ministry such as Jesus hmm. pursued, and that's going to change the church. That's going to change it immensely. Um, the, the theologians are going to have to give us a new, fresh way of presenting the saving work of Christ. And so those, those things come to me with force. Hmm. Okay, so your advice was, we started at, hey, it's great to be alive, and what a privilege if you're under 50 to be leading in this moment. Any other advice for, for driven leaders, either in ministry or in the business space, who would say, wow, I, I got convicted by the description of a driven person as well? I would only, if I was with a group of pastors tonight, and they were saying, what's most truly important? I, I, would, I would put right at the top two things. Um, 
your family comes first. Mm. The cultivation of your marriage um, cannot be ignored in any way, shape, or form. What you discover when you leave a church is how much people have been watching you in the private side of your life. They watch the way you treat your spouse. They watch the way you honor your children. They watch the way you spend time with them, the way you talk about them. And if you talk to, in a demeaning way to your spouse about your spouse in a sermon, people pick that up real quick. Mm. The other side is we, we've got to have a new, fresh approach to what it means to fill this inner space that you and I started out talking about an hour ago. Um, yeah. Our devotional life cannot be kept as shallow as it often is. We've got to cut down on our business. So I, I look for the mega church organization to maybe shrink a little bit and uh, for there to be a whole new emphasis upon how you train men and women to pastor people in groups of 20 or 25. Hmm. That's a good word. That's a really good word. Well, I had a lot of other questions, but I just feel like we we have done what we're called to do today. And that means we'll have to leave the door open for more again if you're open to that. You've said some very kind things to me, and I want to make sure I thank you hmm. before we say goodbye. You, you, you're you always, lifting, uh, always lifting people up, and I, I admire that. Well, you're always lifting me up, and I know that you've blessed so many leaders who continue to listen to the show. And Gordon, it's just such a great joy in my life to have gotten to know you over the last few years, to have a genuine friendship, an email friendship, a Zoom friendship. And one day they'll open the borders and we'll see each other face to face again. And uh, I just want to thank you for pouring into this next generation, um, ordering your private world as well as a trove of other books that Gordon has authored are available everywhere books are sold. You can find them. It's amazing that all these years later, they're all pretty much still in print. It's not wonderful. Yeah, I I just I'm very thankful. Yeah, and thank thank you for you. Thank you, Gordon. Bye, Carrie. Bye. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.